Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the 20th lecture of the course on sociological perspectives on modernity. In the last three lectures especially in the 17th, 18th and 19th lectures, we have discussed the module on synthesizing modernity and social theory through the works of Immanuel Wallerstein, Anthony Giddens and Jürgen Habermas. Now, we are going to collate certain key points in this lecture, where it assumes greater significance to discuss and share certain points of reference, some point certain points of contention. Okay. So far as these three thinkers on synthesizing modernity and social theory is concerned. Okay. What are the key points that we are getting? Okay. To before starting the key points, what we have discussed prima facie okay, in synthesizing modernity and social theory. In synthesizing modernity and social theory, we have attempted to capture the contributions of Wallerstein, Giddens and Habermas to the critical modernist paradigms in society. Okay. Wallerstein's most important work in three volumes, I mean the modern, the modern world system, Brogen, three intellectual influences, okay. namely Marx, the proponents of dependency theory including André Gunder Frank and French historian Fern Fernand Brodin, these three are important and presumably the practical experience and impressions gained from Wallerstein's own work regarding post-colonial Africa, anti-colonial movements in India. Okay. Wallerstein was also influenced by the world revolution of 1968, I mean students uprisings in France okay. and Wallerstein was on the faculty of Columbia University at the time of students uprisings there and, and participated in a faculty committee that attempted to resolve the dispute. Okay. And Wallerstein emphatically mentioned in several works that this world revolution of 1968 marked the end of liberalism as a viable ideology in the modern world system. One aspect of Wallerstein's work is very important that Wallerstein certainly deserves credit for his, uh, for is his anticipating the growing significance of the north-south conflicts at a time when the main world conflict was the cold war. Wallerstein thus rejects the notion of a third world claiming that there is only one world connected by a complex network of uh, economic exchange relationships, I mean that is a world economy or world system in which the dichotomy of capital and labor and the endless accumulation of capital by competing agents account for frictions. This approach is known as the world systems theory. Okay. Wallerstein locates the origin of the modern world system uh, in the 16th century Western Europe and the Americas. We have discussed and how the capitalist world system okay, is very much heterogeneous in, in cultural, political and economic terms okay, uh, and is also characterized by fundamental differences in civilizational development, accumulation power and capital. Okay. Wallerstein does not conceive of such differences as mere residues or irregularities that can and will be overcome as the system as a whole evolves. And we have also discussed how Wallerstein tried to foreground the problematic of core periphery and semi-periphery in terms of economic exchange between core and periphery which takes place on unequal terms. The periphery is forced to sell its products at low prices, but has to buy the coarse products at comparatively high prices. Okay. The, the periphery, I mean this, this, the, what is that semi-periphery? I mean semi-periphery may be a core to the periphery and becomes a periphery to the core. 
One effect of such expansion of the world system according to Wallerstein is the, is the continuing modification of things including human labor. Thus, natural resources, land, labor and human relationships are gradually being stripped of their intrinsic value and turned into commodities in a market which dictates their exchange value, value in exchange. Okay? We have also discussed how Wallerstein foresaw that in, in 1980 that the United States is a hegemon in decline. He was often mocked for this for making this claim during the 1990s, but since the Iraq war this, this argument has become more widespread and popular. He has also consistently argued that the modern world system reached its end point and he believes that the next 50 years or so will be a period of chaotic instability which will result in a new system one which may be more or less egalitarian than the present one. And, and, and Wallerstein's capitalist world system follows dependency theory which intended to combine the developments of the different societies since the 16th century in different regions into one collective development. The main characteristic of Wallerstein's definition is the development of a global division of labor including the existence of indi uh, independent political units at the same time. I mean there is no political center compared to global empires like the Roman Empire. Re em instead, the capitalist world system is integrated on the world mode. Okay? That is why integration of many, many economies into a single unified whole. I mean uh, this is what Wallerstein, I mean this is what, uh, this is how Wallerstein conceptualized globalization. Core periphery, I mean defines the differences, difference between developed countries and developing countries characterized by power and wealth, improved modes of production and so on. Okay? We have also discussed in the context of Marx that modes of production are a combination of forces of production and relations of production. Okay? The score refers to developed countries and the periphery is a synonym for the dependent developing. And the main reason for the position of the developed countries is their economic power through their improved modes of production. And semi-periphery, I mean it defines states that are located between core and periphery. They benefit from the periphery through unequal exchange relations. At the same time, the core benefits from the semi-periphery through unequal exchange relations. And, and then Wallerstein tried to sketch two kinds of modernity. Okay? One is modernity of technology and, and the modernity of liberation. Modernity of technology is alternatively known as flitting modernity, whereas modernity of liberation is alternatively known as the eternal modernity. Okay? There, there, I mean, the, the, the two stories, the two discourses, the two quests, the two modernities, I mean, the modernity of technology and the modernity of liberation, I mean, flitting modernity on the one hand and eternal modernity on the other were quite different, even contrary uh, one to the other. They were also, however, historically deeply intertwined with one another, such that there has resulted deep confusion, uncertain results and much disappointment and disillusionment. This symbiotic pair has formed the central cultural contradiction of our modern world system, the, syst the system of historical capitalism. And this contradiction has never been as acute as it is today, leading to moral as well as to institutional crisis. Okay? And then we have discussed how Wallerstein traces the history of this confusing symbiosis of the two modernities, uh, I mean the I mean flitting modernity and eternal modernity over the history of our modern world system. Wallerstein divides the analysis of the modern world system into three parts. I mean the first one, the 300 to 350 years that run between the origins of our modern world system in the middle of the 15th century till the end of the 18th century. Secondly, the 19th and most of the 20th century or to use the two symbolic dates for this second period, the era from 1789, I mean the French Revolution to 1968, I mean the great uh, student surprisings, the world revolution in France in, in 1968 and the post 1968 period, I mean which marked the end of liberalism. Then we have discussed how does Wallerstein conceptualize capitalist world economy, which has three defining features. I mean, there existed a single axial division of labor within its boundaries, 
with a polarization between core-like and peripheral economic activities. Secondly, the principal political structures, the states were linked together within and constrained by an interstate system which, whose boundaries matched those of the axial division of labor and those who pursued the ceaseless, endless, never ending, incessant accumulation of capital prevailed in the middle run, um, in the middle run over those who did not. Then we have discussed the geoculture of this capitalist world economy is propounded by Wallerstein. Then we have also discussed how Wallerstein tried to dwell upon the end of what kind of modernity. I mean for Wallerstein let it be the end of false modernity, I mean fleeting modernity and the onset for the first time of a true modernity of liberation, I mean eternal modernity. Okay? Then we have discussed the distinctions between modernity and postmodernity. Okay? Then we have discussed Anthony Giddens reflections on, on, on synthesizing modernity and social theory in terms of the structuration theory, I mean duality of the structure. I mean duality of the structure, I mean duality of structure, I mean uh, what, what Giddens uh, implies that, uh, that practices of human agency are both the medium as well as the outcome of, of structure. Okay. And, and the way Giddens tried to look at the problem of modernity, the problem of order is one of time space distanciation. In that time and space are ordered in modernity to connect presence and absence. And these space time separations produce disembedding of traditional forms of relationships as standard and abstract dimensions of space and time come to order and rationalize activities in the place of local contexts. Disembedding mechanisms require the creation of symbolic tokens, require representations, especially money defined as mechanisms to control time and space. They also lead to the establishment of expert systems. Okay. These disembed further according to Giddens because they provide abstract guarantees of expectations across time and space and these impersonal tests and public forms further stretch social systems, they also imply a different kind of trust. Then what is trust according to Giddens? Trust is, trust arises from the lack of full information, it connotes reliability in the face of contingency, it operates as a link between faith and confidence, it involves principles rather than relying on the morality of others, developing confidence in the reliability of a person or system. Trust takes on a more calculative form in modernity and for Giddens, everyday life is more reflexive, so that many people already know something of more specialist areas such as official statistics and it would not be uh, at all unusual to find a coroner who had read Durkheim, Durkheim and solidarity, okay? assemblies of um, people uh, in the performance of rituals. Okay? Everyday life becomes socialized, sociologized as well as psychologized. Okay? And, and the way we have also discussed the ways in which um, Dark, uh, uh, Giddens particularly uh, okay, dismisses the idea of anti-foundationalism or epistemological crisis in postmodernist thought. Okay. Giddens claims that it expresses an awareness, I mean modernity expresses an awareness which is widespread anxieties which press on press in on everyone. Okay. According to Giddens, okay, modernity can be described as the greater and greater use of disembedding mechanisms to organize social life. Nevertheless, there is also considerable re-embedding involving the pinning down of disembedding mechanisms to local contexts again. This happens when relations of trust are also formed by face work or face to face commitments and as a more generalized trust in abstract system develops even where these involve faceless commitments. And relations of trust are always ambivalent. I am not sure whether, whether I will trust you or not. I do not know. That is an ambivalent position. Okay. Confidence is required because there is a fundamental ignorance of the social world, but this implies that trust is largely a matter of making pragmatic connections based on past experiences. However, there is another dimension to it based on a general ontological security. We have discussed how Erickson's uh, child psychology can be summarized. And, and for Giddens, traditional and modern cultures can be contrasted in terms of 
how they create environments of trust and risk. Okay. That is how we have we have discussed uh, actually there is no perception of threat from nature war or gods and supernatural forces no, but there is there is a greater uh, there is a perception of threat from the greater reflexivity of modernity industrialized war and personal meaninglessness. Okay. I mean the, the um, perhaps dangers of excessive reflexivity. Okay. Such adaptive mechanisms to these perceptions of risk and threat are common to both expert and lay people. Expertise rapidly runs into the limits of the predictab predictability of the world and this can produce a pragmatic acceptance and interest in survival. Okay. And a third possibility which, which um, uh, Giddens uh, uh, tried to reflect on okay, is cynical pessimism and, and uh, Giddens of course, has also finally added sustained optimism as well as cynical pessimism. Okay. For Giddens, trust is crucial to modern life and it is intertwined with the growth of globalization. Trust on a more personal level is best seen as a project something to be worked at involving a mutual process of self disclosure. Okay. Uh, good, uh, according to Giddens, globalization leads to displacement of the old embedding mechanisms and a possible re-embedding in a whole dialectic of displacement and re-embedding intimacy and impersonality, expertise and reappropriations and privatism and engagement. Okay. For Giddens, modernity institutionalizes doubt. We have not developed a new postmodernist phase, but rather a complex meaning of presence and absence, not primarily an expression of cultural fragmentation or the dissolution of the subject into a world of science. Rather, the experience of modernity arises from a simultaneous transformation of subjectivity and, and global social organization against a troubling uh, backdrop of uh, high consequence risks. Okay. Then we have discussed uh, Habermas, how Habermas belongs to the tradition of critical theory and pragmatism, how have, I mean Habermas is well known for his work on the structural transformation of the public sphere. Okay. Now, how Habermas's work has been influenced by at least three intellectual trajectories, uh, namely American pragmatism, structural functionalism and post structuralism. Okay. Though many of the central tenets of Habermas's thought remain broadly Marxist in nature. Okay. And we have discussed how Habermas has constructed a comprehensive framework of social theory and philosophy drawing on a number of intellectual traditions, number of theoretical traditions named the German philosophical thought, Marxism, sociological theories of Weber, Durkheim and Mead, linguistic philosophy and speech act theories, development psych developmental psychology, American pragmatism, sociological social systems theory and neo Okay. Habermas, we have also discussed how Habermas considers his major contribution to be the development of the concept and theory of communicative reason or communicative rationality. Okay. As a, uh, I mean, he, when we have already discussed Max Weber's reflection on instrumental rationality or intentional human action or goal oriented social action, okay. as against this, okay, Habermas talks about uh, communicative rationality. Okay. This is very important. If Habermas, I mean, I mean, if I have to look at this, I mean, Habermas perceives the rationalization, humanization, and democratization of society in terms of the institutionalization of the potential for rationality, which is inherent in the communicative competence that is unique to the human species. Other species, they do not have such kind of communicative competence. Habermas contends that communicative competence has developed through the course of evolution, but in contemporary society it is often suppressed or weakened by the way in which major domains of social life such as the market, the state, uh, religions, uh, organizations which have been uh, given over to or taken over by strategic or instrumental rationality. So, that the logic of the system supplants that of the Lebensworld or the life world. Okay. For, for Habermas, the concept of reconstructive science we have discussed has a dual purpose to place the general theory of society between philosophy and the social sciences and to reestablish the rift between the great theorization and the empirical research. Okay. Then we have also discussed how Habermas, uh, Habermas's model of rational reconstructions represents 
the main thread of the service between the structures of the world on the one hand and, and the functions of the world of life on the other. And for this purpose, the dialectic between symbolic representation of the structure subordinated to all worlds of life on the one hand and the material reproduction of the social systems in their complex has to be considered. And this model finds an application above all in the theory of social evolution starting from the construction of the necessary conditions for a phylogeny of the sociocultural life forms the homogenization until an analysis of the development of social formations which Habermas subdivides into primitive, uh, traditional, modern and contemporary formation. The key points that we are going to discuss now, okay, these are attempts to formalize the model of the reconstruction of the logic of development of social formations through the differentiation between vital world and social systems and within them through the rationalization of the world of life or Lebenswald and, and the growth in complexity of the social systems. Habermas tries to offer some methodological clarifications about, about the explanation of the dynamics of historical processes and in particular about the theoretical meaning of the evolutionary theories propositions. Though Habermas considers that the ex post rational constructions and the models of, uh, I mean the models, I mean externalist, I mean system, which are, I mean the relationship between system and environment, I mean such rational constructions cannot have a complete historiographical application, these, these uh, certainly act as a um, general premise in the, in the argumentative structure of the historical explanation. Then what is this public sphere? In, in the structural transformation of the public sphere, Habermas developed the influential concept of the public sphere which, which emerged in the 18th century in Europe as a space of critical discussion open to all where private people came together to form a public whose public reason would work as a check on state power. Okay. Habermas argues that prior to the 18th century, European culture was dominated by the representational culture where one party sought to represent itself on its audience by overwhelming its subjects. And as, as an example of representational culture, Habermas argued that Louis XIV's palace of Versailles was meant to show the greatness of the French state and, and its king by overpowering the senses of visitors to the palace. Okay. Habermas identifies representational culture as corresponding to the feudal stage of uh, development according to Marxist theory, arguing that the coming of the capitalist stage of development marked the appearance of the public sphere. In, 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 in German, it is oftenly checked, okay? uh, that is the meaning is public sphere. Okay? This representational culture is very important in the, in the context of Habermas precisely because of the way in which Habermas uh, tried to do this. I mean Habermas argues the way he argues that, that prior to the 18th century, European culture, the way it was dominated, I mean representational culture, even in, 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 in uh, prior to October revolution, I mean there was, a, there was a, in Russia uh, that uh, the king used to say, I am the state. Okay. Then that king, that, that power, that party so, seeks to represent itself on its audience by overwhelming its subjects. Okay. This is important. And, and Habermas identifies representational culture, okay. that is why I, I said that, that this representational culture also has to correspond to the feudal stage of development according to Marxist theory, which argues that the coming of, of the uh, capitalist stage of development uh, that marked the appearance of the public sphere. In the, in the culture characterized by the public sphere there occurred a public space outside of the control of the state, which can interrogate the state, where individuals exchanged views and knowledge. Okay. In, in Habermas's view, the growth of the growth in newspapers, journals, reading clubs, okay, study circles, masonic lodges, 
and coffee houses in 18th century Europe all in different ways marked the gradual replacement of representational culture with public sphere culture. Habermas argued that the essential characteristic, the, the essential characteristic of, of the public sphere culture was its, uh, I mean was critical in nature. Unlike representational culture where only one party was active and the other passive, the public sphere culture was characterized by a dialogue as individuals either met in conversation or exchanged views via the print media. Okay. Habermas maintains that as Britain was the most liberal country in Europe or was considered the most liberal country in Europe, the culture of the public sphere emerged there first around 1700 and the growth of public sphere culture took, took place over most of the, the 18th century um, continental Europe. In, in Habermas's view, the French revolution was in large part caused by the, the collapse of representational culture and its replacement by public sphere culture. Though Habermas's main concern in the structural transformation of the public sphere was to expose what he regarded as the perceptive or, or sorry, uh, what he regarded as the deceptive nature of free institutions or so called free institutions in the West, his book had a major effect on the historiography of the French Revolution. According to Habermas, a variety of actors resulted in the eventual decay of the public sphere, including the growth of a commercial mass media which turned the critical public into a passive consumer public and the welfare state, which merged the state with society so thoroughly that the public sphere was squished out, okay. that, that invisible public sphere. It also turned, it turned the public sphere into a site of uh, self-interested contestation for the resources of the state rather than a space for the development of a public minded uh, rational consensus. Okay. In his famous book, the, the Theory of Communicative Action of 1981, Habermas criticized the one-sided process of modernization. That is what in the last lectures we have discussed uh, what is modernization theory. Modernization theory postulates that underdeveloped economies will make development possible only if they follow the pattern of development of the already developed nations. Okay? And this singular view, this one-sided process of modernization. Uh, led by forces of economic, uh, administrative and military rationalization was heavily criticized by Habermas in his magnum opus theory of communicative action in, in the theory of communicative action in 1981. Habermas stresses the growing intervention, stresses the, the growing intervention of formal systems in our everyday lives as uh, I mean this the, the theory of communicative action, I mean he traces the growing intervention of formal systems in our everyday lives as parallel to development of the welfare state, corporate capitalism and the culture of mass consumption. Okay? I mean um, the way uh, Habermas tried to work out his theory of communicative action in terms of reason and rationalization of society. Okay? These reinforcing trends. These reinforcing trends rationalize widening areas of public life, submitting them to a generalizing logic of efficiency and control. As routinized political parties and interest groups substitute for participatory democracy, society is increasingly administered at a level remote from input of citizens. Then what is the consequence of this? As a, as a, as a consequence, boundaries between public and private, boundaries between the individual and society, boundaries between the system and the Lebensworld or everyday life, boundaries between these spheres, these institutions are getting eroded, they are deteriorating. Boundaries between public and private, the individual and society, the system and the life world are getting blurred. Democratic public life only thrives where institutions enable citizens to debate matters of public importance. Habermas describes an ideal type of ideal speech situation where actors are equally endowed with the capacities of discourse, recognize each other's basic social equality and speech is 
undistorted by ideology or misrecognition. In this version of the consensus theory of truth, Habermas maintains that truth is what would be agreed upon in an ideal speech situation. Then there is no truth, whatever uh, consensus that we, we try to forge that becomes truth. We do not know actually what is the truth. Truth is arrived at on the basis of some consensus, some agreement. That is why in this version, version of um, uh, the consensus theory of truth, Habermas maintains that truth is what would be uh, agreed upon in an ideal speech situation. Habermas has expressed optimism about the possibility of the revival of the public sphere. This revival uh, uh, that public sphere has to revive, I mean otherwise there will be only, uh, there will be only uh, coercive measures okay, undertaken by the state on the powerless, on the marginalized sections of the society. Habermas discerns a hope for the future in the new era of political community that transcends the nation state based on ethnic and cultural likeness for one based on the equal rights and obligations of legally vested citizens. And this deliberative theory of democracy requires a political community which can collectively define its political will and implement it as policy at the level of legislative system. When, when there is no public sphere, okay, only representational culture or so called representational culture will snub, will, will ensure the absence of any dissenting voices. Okay. This is important and representational culture according to uh, uh, Habermas must be replaced by, must be replaced by public sphere culture. Okay. That is why he has expressed optimism about the possibility of the revival of the public sphere. And, and it is important to understand how Habermas discerns a hope for the future in the new era of political community which transcends, uh, which transcends the nation state based on ethnic and cultural likeness for one based on the equal rights and obligations of legally vested citizens. And this deliberative theory of democracy requires a political community which can collectively define its political will and implement it as policy at the level of the legislative system. And this political system requires an activist public sphere. Then there is, there is a shift from intellectual public sphere to activist public sphere. Okay. Obviously, uh, there is no difference between intellectual Mm, uh, public sphere and activist public sphere, no doubt about it. We do not believe in this, these uh, differences, but still one must understand. When we, when we try to deconstruct modernity, I mean in the context of uh, feminism, in the context of cultural studies, in the context of postmodernism and so on. Okay. The way Habermas foresaw okay, the, the kind of political system, I mean or the, the urgent need of such political system, this political system requires an activist public sphere, where matters of common interest and political issues can be discussed and the force of public opinion can influence the decision making process. This is very important. Okay. Uh, this, this activist public sphere is important to enhance the culture of dissent, the, to, to have uh, freedom of speech, freedom of expression okay? and uh, the force of public opinion okay, can, can certainly influence the decision making process, can certainly influence the policy making process in favor of the marginalized sections of the society, in favor of um, the downtrodden, in favor of the owned classes, the exploited classes in the society. Okay? This is important. Okay? Now, now how we, we, we know the distinctions between modernity and postmodernism and how anti-foundational uh, crisis, uh, anti-foundationalism or epistemological crisis was dismissed by Giddens and let us see how Habermas is trying to bring about a critique to postmodernists or postmodernism. Habermas offered some early criticisms in an essay, Modernity versus Postmodernity in 1981, which has achieved wide recognition. In this essay, 
Habermas raises the issue of whether in sight of in, in, in light of the failures of the 20th century, we should try to hold on to the intentions of the enlightenment, feeble as they may be or should we declare the entire project of modernity a lost cause? I mean those, those uh, uh, holy gym or totality or reflexivity, rationality and social movements, can we just discard them? Habermas refuses, uh, here Habermas says no, Habermas refuses to give up on the possibility of a rational scientific understanding of the of, of the eleventh world, of the life world. Okay? Habermas has several main criticisms of, of postmodernism. First, the postmodernists for, for I mean there are there are many many criticisms which can be made uh, uh, so far as postmodernism is concerned and, and uh, so far as in fact so far as Habermas's criticisms of postmodernism are concerned, but for this for the sake of our for the sake of this course, we have tried to limit to uh, limit our uh, discussion on Habermas's criticisms of postmodernism into fourfold. First, the postmodernists are equivocal about why they are producing serious theory of literature. Okay. Secondly, serious theory or literature. I mean whether what I mean epistemological crisis or anti-foundationalism, is it a serious thing, is it adequate for Habermas. Okay. Secondly, Habermas feels that the postmodernists are animated by normative sentiments, but the nature of those sentiments is concealed from the reader. Postmodernists always suggest that what ought to be normative statements, sentiments what should be, why it has not yet been done, but the way Marxism was also dwelling upon such normative positions, sentiments, normative social order, postmodernism to try to dwell upon that, but Habermas feels that the nature of these normative sentiments uh, is concealed from the reader, so far as postmodernist thought is concerned. Okay. And thirdly, Habermas accuses postmodernism of being a totalizing perspective. Okay. What is that totalizing perspective? That it fails to differentiate phenomena and practices which occur within modern society. Okay. It postmodernism for according to Habermas, postmodernism fails to differentiate phenomena and practices. What is what are available and they, 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 they I mean for Habermas, postmodernism does not know how to make a distinction between phenomena and practices. And last but not the least, okay, Habermas, Habermas asserts that postmodernists ignore that which Habermas finds absolutely central, namely everyday life and its practices. I mean, uh, uh, postmodernists they do not look at everyday life and its and their practices for 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 Habermas. Now, what we are going to do okay, in the lectures to follow that we are going to deconstruct critical modernist paradigms. In so, now, if, if Giddens and Habermas have so much to say about postmodernists, how do postmodernists respond to such, such interrogation, such challenge? This is also important for us. We cannot be one sided. We must have both we must examine both sides that is how it is very important to, to deconstruct modernity. Okay. That is why I gave you the example of difference as per uh, I mean uh, which is a central concept in, in Derrida's deconstruction okay. and from now onward we will try to deconstruct uh, modernity okay. and, and uh, we, are, we are now we are going to uh, I mean till now we have covered okay we have covered five modules of this course okay we are left with two more modules okay which will take um, another 10 lectures I mean uh, deconstructing modernity uh, will take uh, another uh, six to seven hours and a new totality will take two to three hours okay. Mm. Uh, I mean it requires I mean 
we need to complete these two modules not in terms of 10 lectures, but 9 lectures and the la and the last lecture we will try to devote it uh, to sum up everything and deconstruction of modernity what we have done we will try to discuss the feminist challenge I mean how to de deconstruct modernity deconstruction of modernity will be done through three pers perspectives that the modernity can be deconstructed through different perspectives altogether. Okay. We are trying to deconstruct modernity through three perspectives. One is feminism, secondly cultural studies and thirdly postmodernity. These three perspectives are very important. Okay, it does not imply that we do not have other perspectives. We have multiple perspectives to deconstruct modernity. Okay. But for the sake of this course, we are trying to limit our discourse to only these three perspectives and we will see how feminism, cultural studies uh, and postmodernism rise to the occasion and, uh, and interrogate the central pillars of critical modernist paradigms in sociology. Thank you.